Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come down here today. Um, I will uh, warn you ahead of time, every week I give a three-hour lecture on statistics. I think I brought the right lecture, but if not, I hope you brought your pencils and calculator and you will be graded. Um, we're going to talk about uh, um, some of the topics that, that were already brought up earlier with the Secretary's talk. We're going to talk mostly around BW. Uh, bioweapons are an interesting area, uh, at, which is why I, th I think he spent a fair amount of time talking about them. But it's an interesting area because of the topics he brought up, specifically about PCR and detection and the amount of time it takes to detection. Um, we're also going to talk today about some synthetic biology changes that, have, that you've all read about in the newspaper with CRISPR-Cas9 um, and how that impacts BW um, and, and how we deal with it. But the most, one of the most important components that I've read recently decided we need to get into because not everybody knows that bioweapons have been around for a very long time. Um, when I mean very long time, this starts at 400 BC was the first bioweapons being used. Um, and the reason that they've been around for such a long time is they're easy to get. You know, so the early bioweapons were things that norm people normally get sick with. Um, uh, you think about uh, putting a dead body in a uh, well. You know, that's a great way to make people sick. Um, and it's a weapon that was used quite a bit, not only by the Romans and others, um, but even in modern times. Think about um, the uh, uh, blankets that are uh, exposed to smallpox um, that were done several hundred years ago. Um, to the most modern stuff that we just recently started talking about with anthrax and ricin. Um, the very end there, I, didn't, I don't have the most recent stuff in there um, because uh, not all of it is out. Um, but it, I want to sp focus specifically on ricin and that dotted line that, uh, that I have there. Those ricin labs were apartments uh, in the UK. These are not labs that you set up. These were um, studio apartments that were, s were set up to um, grow and perpetuate ricin production. Um, Ricin was found in the U.S. Capitol about the same time, um, and the Capitol was shut down and evacuated. So the challenge here is that um, bioweapons are easy to produce, um, and with some basic um, biology that you learn, uh, even in high school, uh, you can produce some dangerous uh, weapons. That dotted line there is important because that is really the inflection point um, after World, World War II, where bioweapons went from being a state threat to individuals. Um, most of the major uh, bioweapons attacks sent after that line are all individuals. These are terrorist groups. These are fundamentalist followers of different organizations, cults and such. Not large groups, less than five people sometimes were able to produce enough uh, of a biological agent to infect a restaurant and make a lot of people really sick with salmonella. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of bioweapons is they're very, very small and they're easy to get a hold of. Um, it's also important to understand the critical components. What makes a biological weapon? Um, and our focus definitely within the programs here are defense. And so when we look at what makes a biological weapon, we're looking for the types of things that uh, the secretary talked about of what, what do we test with PCR and how do we understand, you know, what is dangerous and what's available um, to others that we need to pay, pay attention to. And also what is just a naturally occurring outbreak versus something that was actually per, uh, done on purpose. So there's basically two components here. There's viruses and bacteria. You've all heard about this. I have three young boys, so viruses are important in my household right now. Um, they all just started public school, so they're bringing them home, and I've been sick for the last three weeks. Um, but the challenge here uh, with viruses and both bacteria is they have three major components that they both have to have. They have to produce something dangerous. They have to produce a toxin, or they have to cause some sort of biological damage. That biological effect is maybe it just eats up your cells, you know, and it, and it, and it uses uh, the components of your cells to continue to perpetuate. Stability and release in a host environment. Um, so... The virus uh, that gets into you, so think about the flu, uh, the flu and the common cold um, that, are, that we're all going to be thinking about in the next month or so. Um, those are things that can uh, go out in the air and perpetuate in the air, and we um, pick up by touching things that people who've been sick have been touched, by shaking hands, by breathing common air. Those types of things um, uh, have both those components. They make you sick. They perpetuate in the host environment, meaning they make you sick. They grow in you, but they also can live in the air. Ebola virus can't really live in the air very long. Um, it's one of those things that you have to transmit through um, close body contact. Um, one of the challenges, the fears of Ebola virus is what happens if it all of a sudden can live in the air like the flu. Um, and so those are the types of things we think about, that stability and release uh, in, in public and host environments. Uh, and then the ability to just grow and replicate. There are lots of biological threats, particularly in the bacterial side that you just can't grow. You know, we can't grow them in the lab. Um, so we can't actually test and build a good PCR test for them because they just do 
not grow unless they're in their native environment. And then viruses and bacteria have a little bit of difference um, uh, that we have to keep in mind, particularly with viruses. So think about pox viruses. Not all pox viruses infect humans. Actually, very few of them do. Um, and so it's a challenge because you want to be able to test and understand how the pox uh, virus operates, the life cycle of the pox virus. And so you can look at animals, but they can also pick up genes that make them infect humans. And so it's dangerous work. Um, and then uh, for viruses, also uh, a re reasonable incubation time. This seems like something that's, uh, that's hard to understand. And really what this means is uh, for viruses to be most effective for an outbreak, they have to live in the host for a long time. Ebola virus, we have people who've been in, uh, uh, recently, actually uh, uh, one just recently was published uh, within the last month. They, they've been infected with uh, Ebola virus for a year and they don't show symptoms. And all of a sudden they so, show symptoms. And so you think back to the secretary's example of uh, Penn Station, um, which is you know, some place I've been to many, 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 many times. Many of us have probably been through. Um, you can have somebody walk through there who's been infected with a dangerous pathogen who hasn't, does, has no symptoms. They've never been sick, but they can spread it everywhere. That's an effective virus. An ineffective virus are some of these viruses that kill people very, very quickly. And the reason for that is, well, you know, the virus doesn't have enough time to replicate and spread beyond um, the, the original host. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, biology isn't helping us here. Evolution selects for viruses that live in hosts for a long time um, because that's how they replicate, that's how they, they carry on their, um, uh, their DNA. And so if you look at, at some of the areas that we, we study when we're looking for countering and defense against this, we're looking for common bacteria that have these traits. And I'll explain why we look at common bacteria that have these traits that may not be dangerous um, when I talk about uh, uh, how these bacteria pass genes back and forth. Um, that's horizontal gene, tr gene transfer. Viruses that are effective uh, in human because they're a good model for how a virus that's not effective in human humans can become effective in humans. Um, evolutionary traits, outbreak uh, response, um, synthetic biology, which has become very important recently. And then uh, again, back to the PCR, the ability to detect something. Um, PCR is wonderful. It's a great technology. Um, it's something that has made big differences in countering weapons of mass destruction, particularly in the biology space. But uh, these bugs evolve away from the markers that we pick. And I'll give you a specific example of that in just a minute. So one of the challenges for identifying pathogens are, are just that. How fast can you figure it out? Sequencing technology um, is where PCR really took off from. Sequencing te technology existed a little bit before PCR, um, but not much because we use PCR to actually amplify and grow out the genes so there's enough genes that our detectors can see them. Um, but with uh, companies like um, Oxford uh, Biosciences and the Nan Nanopore, which is a USB size sequencer that can sequence uh, um, pathogens very, very quickly and for about $100, all of a sudden there's lots and lots of data out there. And so tools like BioVelocity is a tool that, that we use quite a bit um, that are that's used uh, throughout the government uh, in the national defense area. Um, now focuses entirely on how do you detect a, um, the pathogen on the raw data coming off of the machine. So it used to be back in the uh, 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 back, I talk about, you know, when I was still in grad school 15 years ago, um, we used to assemble all of our genomes. We would, the way uh, pyrosequencing works, which is the latest sequencing technology, is it breaks the genome into hundreds of thousands of pieces and sequences them all in parallel. Think about it as like a puzzle, um, and you have to put that puzzle back together. Um, and when you put that puzzle back together, then you can look at it and say, oh, that is Ebola, or that's uh, um, um, anthrax. Now we actually do analysis on the raw data coming out of the sequencer. So we try to reduce that 11 hours that the secretary is talking about to get it as close as possible to say, okay, we know we don't have to put the puzzle back together, but we know this puzzle has this unique piece that no other puzzle has, and all of a sudden I know what it is. And that's what the PCR markers are focused on. The way that it does this is through read mapping. There's other read mapping technologies out there that are very similar to this. Um, and, they're, and it's really critical that, that this technology has become available just in the last few years. Um, so essentially what you see at the bottom there is a, is, a, uh, is a search index. Think about Google search for DNA. Um, this is what we do is we break down um, a reference genome. So we have our examples of Ebola virus. We have examples of anthrax. We actually put them all into the same reference index, uh, the Google kind of index of biology. Um, the colors at the bottom there represent the different pathogens that we've previously identified that have sequences that match up to what we've seen come out of the field. Um, and then the black parts are all of the different samples from the field that we've seen from different patients who've been sick, from collections on surfaces, from native species that we've seen within the environment. Uh, and the idea is to figure out where 
like that area where there's no markers, um, there's no colors, but there's just black, a signature sequence, something that is entirely unique. Um, and so now all of a sudden we have a, a region of the DNA that represents only that version of the pathogen that we saw in that outbreak. And that matters because we try to track where these things come from. We did this specifically with Ebola that I'll get into in just a minute. Um, kind of an interesting mathematical <laughs> principle of how we do it is there's one base pair difference between each one of those uh, uh, kind of bins or buckets that we put this information in. And that matters um, because, uh, I'll not get to that in just a minute, it matters because one of the things that we've been able to do in science with this type of analysis is we can now look at all possible sequence combinations that exist. So think about all the possible um, theoretical PCR markers that you could generate for a sensor. We can figure out all of them. And there are many, 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 many of them. Um, and when you actually sit down and map everything that we know of nature, of biology that exists within the, the National Center of Bio Biomedical Information, which the NIH operates, which is kind of the central repository for the US and Europe and most countries of all the information we know, we actually map uh, genomes to less than half of those locations. So that means that it's possible we have only seen or known half the, G the DNA that actually exists within the world. And, there's, and PCR is a wonderful example of this. The technology that makes PCR work came out of a, a bacteria, I think it was a bacteria, uh, that lived in a really hot um, uh, whirlpool uh, in Yosemite. Was it Yosemite? Yeah, Yosemite. And the scientists scraped it off the back at like 100 degrees Celsius or something. It only grows at that really high temperature and isolated this enzyme um, that we now use for PCR. There are many areas we haven't sampled. Um, and there are places where there are infections diseases that we have never seen before just because a human hasn't walked through that area before. Um, and that's kind of the rest of this world that exists that we have no idea yet. Um, so this is the workflow for how we do a signature sequence, but let me show you a real example. This was the 2014 Ebola outbreak. That was a unique outbreak um, because it was so big um, and it was hard to detect. Um, the reason that it was hard to detect is, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to give away the punchline yet. So um, re really the challenge was in 2014, Ebola virus outbreaks happen every single year. You've been reading about one that's been going on particularly long. Usually they start around Christmas time. They'll go through the winter. Um, but this one that's been going on right now has been particularly uh, uh, long lived, but not as dangerous as the 2014 one. The 2014 one had lots of people involved in it. Um, our friends at, at Broad Institute that we work with quite a bit were trying to understand what was the difference between uh, the Ebola virus of 2014 and all the other ones we'd seen before, and this was about December of 2014. Um, the challenge was that not only was this a particularly virulent version of Ebola, our PCR markers were not working as effectively as they had in the past. All of a sudden, we couldn't detect who had been exposed and who was sick. And that's because these are the markers that existed at the time. Um, there were four or five of them. Uh, they had existed for a long time. And we knew that over time, uh, Ebola virus and bacteria will evolve away from the markers that we generate. And so you have to constantly rebuild the markers for PCR. Um, and uh, our folks up at the Broad had decided that this is a brand new version of Ebola that we had never seen before. Actually, what it turned out to be, this is the work that we did uh, with the Army labs. It turned out that it wasn't a new version. It was people were infected with multiple versions of Ebola virus at the same time. They didn't have enough of that pathogen that our PCR markers were working and the evolution that moved away from them had actually happened. And so now what we've done to defend that is we've gone beyond just four or five PCR markers. We now have dozens that we look at. Um, but that does increase the cost, increase the time to analyze and actually identify that somebody has a particular, Ebola, a, a particular version of the Ebola virus. So now the, the scarier part is synthetic biology. So um, the most recent programs we're starting to get into and the research that I am doing is really focused on how do you understand synthetic biology. Um, so the frame, there's a wonderful paper that came out in the National Academy of Sciences recently that really focused on how do we do a risk assessment for synthetic biology. Um, when you think about synthetic biology, you think about all of a sudden within the genes, the, these pathogens, we have building blocks which are the genes, and we have now figured out how to rearrange and change out all of those building blocks. Um, the collaborators I work with right now are J. Craig Ventner Institute on our research program. They have actually entirely synthesized a bacterium from the from base. So they uh, took out every gene and then built 
from the base up to try to, try to figure out what is the core set of genes necessary um, to actually operate a bacterium. And so there's a new version of bacteria that exists that had never existed in nature that is now JCVI's version. Um, and that's a good uh, example of kind of what we're doing here. We're looking at, when we look at risk assessment, we're trying to understand um, what are the most important components of the cell? Um, what are, and I'm pulling this up because it's hard for me to read from over here. You know, how easy is it, how can we make a pathogen easier to use or how could somebody who wants to use it make it easier to use? Um, how can we, and there's, there's reasonable ways to do this. So if you have a biosafety level two pathogen and you wanna do research on it, you can move it down to biosafety level one by removing a bunch of the dangerous components of it and the infectious components of it. So there's good reasons to do that, but there's also dangerous reasons to do that. How do I make it grow in media that I can buy at Target as opposed to having to buy from a science uh, distributor? You know, someone that we're paying attention to. So ease of use is a big important component. Production and stability. So the think about the uh, examples that I showed earlier. How do you make a pathogen more stable in the environment? How do you make Ebola virus live longer than you know a few seconds out in the air? So all of a sudden people can inhale it instead of having to have close physical contact. These are all of the uh, ideas and methods that are going into how do you evaluate something for synthetic biology. Um, and uh, the challenge here is it used to be that there are only certain genes that we could synthesize and inject into a pathogen or a virus, and now we can do any gene that we want. Um, and we can splice out the evidence that we actually did it. Um, I've kind of gone So there's a new program um, that I'm working in called Felix. This is through IARPA. So the next challenge of, of and if you read through this paper, is not only is it dangerous to actually put these pathogens, to, um, to create these new pathogens, and the technology exists that we can change any gene we want, and we can splice out the evidence that we actually did the, ch the changes. With all of that, how do we actually tell that the Ebola virus that's going around West Africa right now was not engineered and was developed through, through natural evolution. And that's a challenge. And so Felix is focused on how do we figure that out. Um, some examples of how we deal with that, uh, we look at horizontal gene transfers. So um, within bacteria, bacteria, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system existed in bacteria for a long time, for longer than we knew that it existed. Um, and the reason it was there is that it's a great method for bacteria to swap genes back and forth. Uh, e. coli loves to do this. The 2011 German E. coli outbreak was a great example of this, where a particular E. coli strain had inherited a toxin from another organism that was particularly dangerous to people's uh, kidneys, and it would kill your, uh, it would wipe out your kidney. Um, it, ha it hadn't previously existed. Nature made it exist. It horizontally gene transferred because those two pathogens existed in the same environment for a while, and this happens all the time. Um, this is one way that we end up with new strains of different uh, uh, um, bacteria and viruses. Um, and if you look over time on the right-hand chart, you actually see that the core genes that exist within a pathogen goes down significantly as you uh, look, as you add more and more pathogens to a mixture. So how do you actually separate out a mixture of natural pathogens from a mixture of an engineered pathogen? It's very, very difficult. We actually don't know how to do that right now, which is what Felix is focused on. Um, here's another wonderful example. This is a plot of all of those. You go back to, uh, we talked about earlier with the biovelocity and the different bins and indexes. So this is each bucket of DNA that we um, break down and try to analyze whether it exists in nature or not. Um, this is comparing all of those buckets between salmonella and E. coli. What's important is where you see red and not green. Those are the actual differences between the pathogens. Where you see green, which is you know 99% of that chart, is where you cannot tell Ebola and salmonella apart from each other. The difference is Ebola is a BSL level one and Salmonella is a BSL level two. And Salmonella makes you very sick. Now, I mean, uh, sorry, Ebola, E. coli. E. coli can make you sick, but it doesn't naturally do it. It has to pick up a pathogen to do it. But Salmonella is much more dangerous. So you can see there's actually not that much difference at the DNA level between these organisms. And so it's very tricky for someone to, it's very tricky for someone trying to counter weapons of mass destruction to actually sit there and say, okay, um, I, uh, I know that this was actually engineered and this was not engineered. Um, here's another example of how you can do this. This was, again, uh, E. coli strains. We're looking at antimicrobial resistance, which has become very important for E. coli and a lot of these pathogens. One of the biggest markers that somebody has engineered a pathogen is that it all of a sudden becomes uh, antimicrobial resistant. So in, a diff di in addition to a dangerous pathogen that's out there that has been engineered for a reason we don't under understand, all of a sudden it's resistant to some of the antimicrobials that we use. Um, each color that you see there is a different antimicrobial resistance gene and how they 
are, now that they've been infected into E. coli strains, how they actually transfer back and forth between the different, different strains. So not only are people who engineer this capability into E. coli, once it's in there, the rest of the E. coli population picks it up. And something that's very unique about antimicrobial resistance that, is, um, that we don't clearly understand is once a pathogen becomes antimicrobial resistant to one uh, um, antibiotic, it very, very quickly picks up multi-antibiotic resistance. Not because they're using the same mechanisms. These are antibiotics that use different mechanisms for some reason. The pathogen now starts, selects, starts to select for to become multi-antimicrobial uh, um, res resistant. Um, and so it gets very complicated. Now, the other side of it is you look at that is... Um, E. coli, um, which is not terribly complicated in terms of looking at the phylogeny, but one way to organize it is through antimicrobial resistance. Um, this is B. subtilis. So this is a bacillus that exists out there. This is uh, the, the hay version of anthrax. Um, it doesn't uh, affect humans, but it's a good example that we use quite a bit in counter BW research and trying to identify um, if someone has engineered a pathogen or not. This is our model organism. You can see when you compare on the right-hand side there that uh, tree graph of, um, of E. coli and this tree graph of B. subtilis, uh, there's a lot of diversity in these pathogens. Pathogens, and particularly in the bacillus pathogens. So anthrax is a bacillus pathogen. Um, the challenge for this is all of a sudden, when you look at what's on the right, which is B. subtilis subtilis, which is the kind of the core and the type example that we use, and the far left, which are also B. subtilis, they actually share less than 70% of their genome. That's actually less than what we as mammals share with all other mammals in, in the world that we know of. So these, these pathogens that we have classified as the same organism may actually not be the same organism. Um, and this is a piece of data that we're only starting to understand because we now have genetics be able to track it. Um, and so uh, this is one of the challenges of, um, of, uh, of, uh, engineering, of engineering pathogens is one of the things that um, the engineering world has been able to come up with, those who are doing synthetic biology, if they, they have shown that the particular region of bacterium that we mostly use to organize who they are, they have spliced it out and switched it out with another organism. All right, and so this is called 16S. 16S sequencing used to be the standard for trying to figure out if a pathogen is a pathogen. Um, the or, uh, researchers have successfully switched out the 16S region between two different pathogens. So now you can make an, a, a, an anthrax look like a near neighbor. Um, and so if you do that, all of a sudden your PCR markers no longer work. So the way that we're applying biovelocity today to do this research is uh, biovelocity, again, is this bin-based uh, bin system where it's kind of like a Google index. We're building a brand new Google search engine that instead of being built on what exists within kind of the known universe of bacteria, um, actually exists within the known universe of sequencing. Um, so if I haven't already made you nervous, I'm about to make you even more nervous. Uh, there are companies that uh, uh, actually two of them are nonprofits. One's called Biobricks. The other one's called Adgene where you can call them up and they will mail you the building block uh, in a, a structure that you can immediately insert into your pathogen. You don't even have to do the synthesis yourself. You, may, you sequence by phone is what the uh, folks who do synthetic biology talk about. Um, and you can go online and order these things for less than $50, you know, a vial of a particular engineered sequence that will insert into whatever you tell them it needs to insert. They'll also sell you the backbones. This isn't bad stuff. This is science. They're trying to perpetuate a technology so that people understand how to use it. The challenge for that is now, again, anybody, think about those ricin labs that were, you know, studio apartments in the UK, can build a synthetic biology laboratory in their kitchen or in their bathroom. Um, and so we're taking those libraries and we're building the brand new Google index of, bio, of bio, biological information, which is just the components that are sold within these organizations. Because we have sequences for most, most of them. And so we compare them to then the reference genomes um, as well as conserved regions to try to identify what could be a PCR test for that particular um, engineering component. The problem with that is most of the engineered components um, that are available from these resources around the world are actually what are, in, what are in what we call conserved regions. These are regions of DNA that actually are not different between pathogens. So now all of a sudden we can say, oh, it maps to an engineered component that you can buy online, but I can no longer tell you whether it's anthrax or um, a different version of bacillus.
And so it gets particularly tricky. Um, it even gets trickier than that because one of the other things that uh, um, those who do uh, synthetic biology um, are very good at is silencing components of the bacterium. So not, uh, not only can they engineer a particular region and put in a, um, a, uh, a, a toxin that didn't exist before, they can set up a, a region ahead of that toxin in the DNA that will actually shut down that toxin if you grow it in the media that they know we all grow stuff in. All right, so you have to grow it on a very specific medium that only they have, say it's a high salt media, um, and it will produce that toxin or it'll produce it in humans, but the laboratory media that you're gonna grow it on um, to do your PCR test in the field, it will shut off that gene. So now all of a sudden you, you'll see the gene in the sequence, but it won't show up in other areas that won't be expressed. And so it's a way to hide what they have done. Um, and so one of the other areas we're looking at is not only because we can uh, adapt things, things between base pairs, not only can we um, identify um, the pathogen and identify um, the toxin that was inserted, try to identify the mechanism, if there's any of the me mechanism le left, we're also trying to figure out if it actually exists in nature, meaning that's producing the toxin or not. Um, and so this is some of the work that we do. Um, the other interesting area, uh, area of research uh, associated with this um, is that it's a way to separate out evolution from engineering. Um, when you separate out evolution of engineering, you're looking, evolution is looking specifically for kind of the lowest energy mechanism to get a toxin out there. Um, when you engineer something, often it's not the lowest energy. It's using a lot of, of energy for the bacteria to actually produce it, um, and that's another way that we detect it. Um, this is an example of some of the prototyping we've done. Uh, we can now look at an entire protein for um, uh, the bonding potentials around those proteins. We can look at, at how those components actually work, um, uh, work together to, uh, to produce um, the toxin that we're interested in. Um, and then in the end, we can actually um, determine whether we think it, was, it came out from evolution or um, engineering uh, and potentially where that engineering came from. Um, the other challenge is attribution, which we're not even working on. We're really focused on just is the, is the path, has the pathogen, pathogen been engineered um, or is it natural? Um, so I do have a couple minutes for questions. I think it says four minutes. So uh, I went a little long, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Can you identify spores? Uh, yeah, so the spore phase um, of anthrax is particularly hard to get the DNA out of. Um, and so, yeah, so if you have, uh, if you, in order for the PCR hybridization to work, you have to have the DNA. Um, it's been done, but it's not easy. So um, that's not the best phase. That's why if you have a spore, you want to try to grow it. Now the problem with growing it is it does change the DNA and so you can change your markers. Um, so yeah, that's a particular challenge for anthrax and any bacterium that has a spore state. Um, and it makes sense that if someone wanted to release it, they could release it in a spore state. So yeah, that's a challenge. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Could non-nation states uh, weaponize this into, with the, bio, with the bioengineering, possibly? Uh, so you're talking about non-nation state actors? Yes. Oh yeah, that's the biggest threat. You know, we, I mean, you, the, uh, um, the people who, do, who can do this work, um, you don't need a PhD to do this work. Um, you, uh, because you can order the synthesized DNA online or through the phone, um, have it sent to your house, and now all you have to do is be able to grow the pathogen and introduce the synthesized DNA, and you know you can mess it up as many times as you want because it doesn't cost very much money. So yeah, this is, you don't need to be a nation state to do this at all. Um, this is kind of the threat that we're trying to deal with is that all of a sudden there are lots and lots of people can do it. And that's the example of that first slide I went through is most biological uh, attacks uh, in the last 30, 40 years have been by non-nation state actors, you know, individuals, cult followers, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Aside from the Felix program. One yeah. second for the, the mic. Need, and the need for the IC now to get more mm -hmm. and more involved at the very beginning for change detection yeah. at a software level perhaps, but uh, do you see you know, future programs in the IC being able to address this? 
Um, yeah, I mean, within this environment, we can't get in, into what they're doing, but I, I think kind of the general answer is certainly, uh, I mean, Felix is funded by IARPA, you know, and so that's a, a program that the IC is deep into. And, and yeah, I mean, there's been more funding available because of this threat and getting into the early components um, is the only way to do it because you're in, you're not interested in nations, you're interested in individuals. And so um, I think the challenge that they have right now is, okay, what, first of all, is it engineered, is it not engineered, which is what we're working on. The next one is, okay, who did it? And that's a really hard question because now you're, yeah, you know, you're not, think about all the grad students, you know, and, you know, my, I teach graduate school, the graduate program I teach is, um, I think I have 32 students this year. I think 22 of them are, are foreign nationals and, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, it, it, the population gets really big. So, yeah, it's tough. It's a hard question. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so that's actually one of the challenges we're working on right now as well. Um, we have our first simulated genomes just came out um, about two weeks ago through our program. Um, yes, yeah, so we're doing a lot of that simulation. Um, the challenge that we run into with simulations is actually very similar to the cyber challenge. Um, so simulated cyber data is very difficult to work with because it doesn't represent the true world. Simulated genomes, we have the same problem. So you can simulate these inserts and put them in there. Uh, and not only do we simulate them, we also create our own engineering. Um, when you compare the two of them historically, um, they don't they don't match. So algorithms that are trained on the simulated data don't work on the real data. Um, we think we've gotten past that, um, but you know, it's been a challenge, and, and this is you know a brand new area to try to get. And the reason behind that, from a and this is I'm sorry, a little bit of the statistics lecture, um, is that uh, the, the distribution for the simulated data follows kind of noise, and all of a sudden you're training these machine learning models on noise, and they just can't separate out the nor noise from the normal signal. Where we can, because we're biologists, we look at a microscope and we're like, yeah, that's that, and that's that. Um, Hopefully, computers are getting better, and this next batch of data we just started producing a few weeks ago will be better. Um, but there's skepticism. I'm I'm the PI, and I'm skeptical. So I mean, it's I, I hope we can do it because I would significantly increase the data set that's available. But right now, it's not up to now. It's not been successful. So, yeah. Uh, what is your class of work you teaching? Oh, pardon? What is your class of work you teaching? <laughs> I teach statistics at George Mason. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually really enjoy it. It's graduate class, but I also love math, so I'm weird. All right. I think I'm actually out of time. So thank you very much.